As we continue into our series now in the book of Philippians, we have already been blessed to see how this church, the church at Philippi in the first century, was started by the Apostle Paul and his missionary band. And around the year 49 AD, we saw how Paul preached there to uh, the people. It was to a small group of women who were praying. We saw Lydia get saved. We saw a, a slave girl get cast free from her demon. And we also saw how the church was established through a Philippian jailer. Now that Philippian jailer might come back to be helpful in our understanding of this, of this uh, passage specifically today. Last week, we talked about Paul as he opened the letter. He, he loves the Philippians and he prays for the Philippians. And so we talked about how he prayed for them. He's so thankful for them. He loves them. He's confident that God is working in them and he just adores them. He, his affection is warm. He yearns and longs to see them. In fact, he prayed not only that he'd be with them, he prayed that they would grow, they would abound in their love that they would have a love that's based not on their own understanding, but on God's will, on being able to discern what exactly is God's will, and that they would be pure because they love the Lord, they love the, his gospel, they love the church, and they have a discernment of what is right. Well, as we tra transition to the next section, Paul is now going to give a report about how he's doing. He already said hello. He already said, oh, I love you guys. I miss you guys. I'm praying for you guys. Now he's moving on in his letter, and he's going to tell them how he's been doing, because we have to remember that he's been in prison. Uh, he's been in different prisons along his missionary journey. The prison, if you will, and put it in quotes, that he's in now is he's actually under house arrest while he's in Rome, and he is chained to guards the whole time. So he is in prison in the sense that he is not free to do as he wish. Now he is free to live in his particular cordoned off home, uh, but he's not free to do whatever he wants. He, he actually has a, a chained guard to him 24 seven. So he's gonna now do, give a report. And so we wanna ask, what are we to learn about the importance of the gospel? He's gonna talk all about the gospel in our passage today, and he's gonna really put it on uh, to shine its importance. What are we to learn about the importance of the gospel from Paul's imprisonment report? So let's get to our first point. We're going to have three points this morning as we look in these verses. I think they'll be helpful for us. Our first point this morning is this. It's that God orchestrates believers' sufferings and persecution to advance the spread of the gospel. That God, if we remember, is a sovereign God. He controls all things. And we talked about this earlier, if you were with us. He is orchestrating the details of people's lives so that he gets glory. And what we're going to see from Paul and the details of his life is that he's orchestrating the sufferings and he's orchestrating the persecution that is going on, which would have been possibly been seen to be a defeat. No, no, no. We're going to see clearly not a defeat. God is working all things out to bring about the advancement and the spread of the gospel. This is not only true in, in Paul's day, but it's true in our day. God is still sovereign. God is still providentially working all things out and this is a very helpful teaching for us as we consider the perspective of our suffering and the perspective of the different difficulties we may be going through. Let's go back to verse 12. Paul, starting his report, says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that word brother includes both, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, my imprisonment, my being connected for now two years on house arrest in Rome, has really served to advance the gospel. Let me stop there. Is this most people's like not normal experience of a person, right? When somebody is under house arrest, you wouldn't expect them to be so cheerful. <laughs> you wouldn't expect them to be so grateful or so excited. In fact, that's one of the hallmarks of this whole, this whole uh, letter is that it's filled with the joy of the Lord. That's why we, we, we named this whole thing persevering gospel joy, that you can have God's joy in your life regardless of the situation, the, the circumstance. Why? Because you are his, you were made by the gospel, you were made for the gospel, so no matter what, keep going. Keep going in the work of the gospel. That is 
a bullseye to what we're going to hear today in our passage. He's so excited. Hey, guys, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known in the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Let's stop here. Paul, um, writing from Rome, which is about 800 miles away from the church at Philippi, he's writing by letter, um, has been under house arrest for two years at this point. In fact, we can read about this particular imprisonment in the chapters of 21, uh, Acts 21 through 28. We know that what has happened to him in, in those, uh, during that time corresponds to what's going on right now. And in, in Acts 28, chapter, chapter 28, verse 20, he says how he's chained to a guard. In fact, we know, based on the kind of chain that it was talked about, that it was, it was only roughly 18 inches to two feet long, this chain. It was chained to his wrist, chained to another wrist. Now imagine being chained to a Roman guard, a Roman uh, uh, from the Praetorian Guard. And by the way, the Praetorian Guard, we should talk about this. The Praetorian Guard or the Imperial Guard was kind of like the super elite uh, you know, group of the Roman soldiers. You might, you might even say it's like the Secret Service because they were specifically, uh, their job was to guard the emperor himself. And so there was a large group. I mean, Rome was very powerful, had a large, large uh, empire as well as military. The Praetorium Guard was what we can estimate anywhere between nine and 10,000 of their soldiers that were specifically the Praetorian Guard. And what does he say in verse 13? It says, it's advancing the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He is so happy about what? Not necessarily about him being chained to somebody 18, to two feet, 18 inches to two feet away. I mean, let's be honest. That's a drag. <laughs> That's not fun. That's not easy. In fact, from what, from what we know from the historical records, it looks like of those many thousands of Praetorian guards, they, were, they went in six-hour cycles, six-hour shifts. And so that being the case, Paul was on 24-hour watch. He had four guards that would cycle through every day, every six hours. And it was very common that those guards would not all they wouldn't necessarily repeat. It wasn't like the same four guards over and over and over again. It was often all the Praetorian guards would, you know, would be sent to different things. And so um, if I was chained to somebody like that physically, I'd probably have a bad attitude about it. <laughs> it wouldn't be fun for me. But look at what Paul sees this as. He goes, this is great. I have a captive audience. <laughs> like they can't leave him even if he tried. Awesome. Think of Paul's perspective here. His perspective is not one of, hey, I've been, um, speaking of the fifth commandment, honoring the authorities, he's, he's honoring the authorities and not complaining about them, uh, even though he was unrighteously jailed. He was jailed for what? For preaching, for preaching. And in fact, that's what the Praetorian guards ends up finding out. They get chained to him, and what, what does Apostle Paul do? How are you doing, sir? Praetorian sir. <laughs> uh, do, you know, do you know about Jesus? Do you know that's why I'm here? Do you, do you, have you heard of Jesus yet? I mean, his name is a very important guy. Have you heard of him yet? Can I talk to you about him? Keep it short. You know, like, what, what is it going to be? Well, he's there forever. He, he has to sleep in some way with this guy. He has to eat with this, with this guy, even use a restroom, we would imagine, with this guy. I mean, this is a hard situation. But what does Paul say? Praise the Lord. Look at all these people who need Jesus. You need Jesus? Well, let's talk about that for a while. He says the whole guard has found out that his imprisonment is for Christ. This guard, these guards are finding out this guy isn't a criminal. This guy is a preacher. This guy is not trying to cause trouble in Rome. He's trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, he seems very... Uh, polite. He seems very submissive to us. He's, he, he's not, I mean, think about if you've been in law enforcement or if, if you, sometimes you can have a hard edge if you're in law enforcement, right? Because you deal with a lot of people who are against authority. What a blessing it would have been to be with Paul, 
who didn't hate these guards, who wasn't trying to get away from these guards, who was actually showing love and care and concern for these guards. I mean, didn't he preach the gospel to the Philippian jailer? What did he say when the Philippian jailer was trying to kill himself because he knew, oh no, a great earthquake happens, all the chains came undone, people can leave, the bars are open, now people can get out. What happens? Paul says, hey, don't worry, jailer, we're all here. We're all here. That's the kind of prisoner he was. He he was like the best prisoner ever, (laughs) right? He had a great attitude, and he saw his circumstance not as one to complain because he was uncomfortable, but a circumstance in which he had an opportunity to share the gospel. This is all girded and supported by very important doctrine, the doctrine of God's sovereignty, or specifically what we might call the doctrine of God's providence. If you've been around here, we use that term a lot because this is an important doctrine. Let me just read to you a, a short part from our, our, uh, our church confession, the Second London Confession, talking about providence. It's saying that God is comprehensively using everything to bring about his will. Look what it says. God, the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, upholds, directs, arranges, and governs all creatures and things from the greatest to the least by his perfectly wise and holy providence to the purpose for which they were created. His providence leads to what? What what is the providence going to... Uh, result in, it leads to the praise of the of glory of his wisdom, his power, his justice, his infinite goodness and mercy. God is a sovereign God, and he's bringing about every single detail of our lives to bring about his own glory. And he saved us through Jesus Christ. And so we can look at our circumstances, and let's be honest, it's easy to complain when things are hard. It's easy to complain when we, are, when we experience some sort of suffering. In fact, I don't know. I think it's, the, it's true for the human heart that we've always been complainers and grumblers. That's why it's in the Bible so often <laughs> that it's, it's wrong to grumble. It's wrong to sin. Uh, it's wrong to, to not trust the Lord in, in the details of our life. But this is such an important doctrine for us to go down deep into our soul to trust that no matter what is going on, just like Paul, no matter whether he's on house arrest, chained to a guard, or if he's free and able to visit the Philippians, no matter what, he's always saying, God is in control. He's doing something good. Let me partner with him and see how I can be used of God. Notice his attitude. It's not not about his circumstance. It's about his attitude. It's not about his comfort. It's it's really about his perspective. Um, this doctrine is clearly taught throughout all of Scripture. I'm not going to go through all of it, but let me just give a few representative examples many of us probably know of God using very difficult things to bring about his goodwill. Just look at the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 50 of the, the, the Joseph, right? Joseph was sold into slavery. He was abandoned by his brothers, left for dead. Then he, not only after slavery, he goes into prison himself, for two years, funny enough, kind of like Paul in this particular one. But what happens? After, after that, he then gets elevated into a place of the palace. And in that palace, it's from there that he's actually able to do good and be a blessing to the very same brothers who persecuted him. And so what does he say in Genesis chapter 50? When the brothers come back asking for help, they're scared because they know better that, he, he, um, that they thought he was dead. Well, 19 of chapter 50 says, And Joseph said to them, the brothers, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. We have a clear example of this idea of God working out the details, even the very difficult details, in order to bring about God's goodness. All we need to do is then look to just Jesus as the ultimate example of this. Jesus was the perfect man. He was God-man, and he was the Son of God, took flesh to himself, 
And what did he do? He perfectly obeyed the law of God, even when his own family, even when his own people rejected him, even when he was even treated horribly by human authorities, by the religious authorities. And what does in Acts the Apostle Peter say about all this? It was according to God's plan. For truly, verse 27, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Four different groups there were all going against Christ. We talked about Psalm 2 this morning. That is a, a psalm that was fulfilled by all of these occurrences. To do what? To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God foreordains things to take place. And not only that, it's true for us. It's true in the church. Paul, the same author, is going to tell the Romans uh, to not fear things because God is working all things out. Romans 8, this, is a, this should be a comforting verse for us because it's true. We know that for those who love God, for the church, for believers... All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And so I want to ask you this morning, how quick are you to discern God's will during difficult providence, or uh, to discern God's difficult providence? Meaning there are difficulties that take place in God's governing through his providence. How quickly is your heart aligned to realize God is doing something right now? Does your heart quickly go towards complaining, quickly go towards grumbling, quickly go towards, oh, man? Or in God's sanctifying your heart and your soul, is God teaching you, hey, I'm always working. I'm always doing something. Trust me. Follow me. Obey me. I'm working it out for good. You know, um, I think of my mom. My mom has passed, as many of you knew her. My mom was quite the evangelist, huh? Right, Dad? My mom was quite the evangelist. I mean, she would take the time to share with anybody who could listen <laughs> about Jesus, and that's not an overstatement. She's, she was very bold in the gospel, but my mom was also very sick. She was sick and um, had m several different cancers, many different surgeries, dozens and dozens of procedures over many years of her life. It was a very difficult trial for all of us who knew her, grateful for my, my father who took care of her. But I look to my mom as a good example. It was regular for my mom to be able to share her faith when she was in the hospital. She would talk to the nurses, talk to the doctors, talk to anybody who would listen. Why? Because she knew God had a plan for her life. God was going to use even a really difficult situation like being sick and ill he would use for his glory. He would use. And I know that God did it, or God used my mom in a way to bring about life, to bring, she preached the gospel. People came to faith around her in different ways, in different times. She's a good example of not letting her circumstances determine her attitude. No, her attitude was applied to whatever circumstance she was in. Praise the Lord for a, a good example of that. We, we have other examples um, maybe some of you are aware of, of John Bunyan. He was the, the, the Baptist preacher who was imprisoned himself. In fact, if you know anything about his story, he was, he was a preacher who was preaching against the, church of, the Anglican church who required uh, certain practices in, cert, in, in the church that were not from the scriptures themselves. And so he said, I will not follow them. And that he was he was compelled to preach no matter what. Well, he got imprisoned because he was preaching against the church. And what do they say? They say, you can be released from prison if you stop preaching. Go ahead and stop preaching and you can be released day right now. Well, he said, I cannot but preach. God has called me to preach. And if God has called me to preach and I must do it, then I'll preach in prison. In fact, he stayed there for 12 years in prison, knowing that any one of those days he could have walked out if he just would have agreed to not preach. Well, he preached every single day for 12 years. And in fact, it was from prison that John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. One of, uh, after the Bible, The Pilgrim's Progress is the second most purchased book in all of the world. 
of history. The Bible's number one. Number two, Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote it from prison. Why? Because, not because he was sad or because he was worried about his situation. It's true. I'm sure he was concerned about his physical uh, you know, body and danger, but he had a stronger belief that God was working things out. Is that true for you? Do you have a trust in God that no matter what the circumstance, God is working? How quickly is your joy stolen because things don't go right? How quickly? I know I'm guilty of getting grumpy uh, when things, when like stuff doesn't happen right, small things, right? How about driving? How easy is it to get upset when you drive? Um, instead of, you know, trusting the Lord and, and being joyful. It it's really is an attitude issue. This is a perspective issue. It's a heart issue. Do we love the Lord? Do we trust the Lord? No matter what, our life is blessed by him. Even in the hard stuff, he's got a good plan for us. He's going to use us. So let's try to join in with that. Uh, I appreciate this passage from Jeremiah. It's talking about how we're blessed if we trust the Lord. Jeremiah 17 says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes. Are you scared? Are you... Are, are you mentally affected, emotionally affected when hard things come? It says, who does not fear when the heat comes? For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. We want to be the type of Christians who love the Lord, who trust the Lord, that no matter what, when the car goes out, instead of rum grumbling, we think, okay, the Lord must have a plan here. Maybe there'll be somebody I could share the gospel with. Maybe there'll be somebody I'll run into that God has for me, the kind of sovereignty that he's working to bring about his plan. Well, let's look at our second point for this morning as we continue in our passage. The first is understanding that God orchestrates all of the details of our life to, to be able to advance the gospel, really, even through the sufferings. Well, our second point is this, is that believers are indeed called to boldly speak the gospel without fear. We are called as believers, as church members, as Christ followers, not only to have the right perspective uh, that God is working all things out, but then we are called to step into, to step into what God has called us to do, which is preach the gospel. We're called to open our mouths. We're called to say things clearly about Jesus Christ. Let's read that this is exactly what happened and was the result from Philippians chapter 1.14. It says, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and much more bold to speak the word without fear. What happened when Paul was imprisoned and under the guard of the Romans for two years, chained to a personal guard six hours at a time? It didn't hurt the cause of Christ. It didn't hurt the church. It helped the church. In fact, we, we've seen this in our, in our day. We understand uh, the church often grows under persecution. It often gets strengthened when things get harder. Why? Because all the people who are just sort of, eh, Christianity, I'll be a Christian as long as it's easy. I'll be a Christian as long as it doesn't ruffle any feathers. Well, all those people fall by the wayside, and the people who are true, who love the Lord, who want the Lord, who, say, who, who, who perk up and say, okay, Time to, go, time to be real here, time to be tested here, the, 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 the true believers say, okay, well, then God has a plan. Let's lean into it. Let's see what he has for us. So what happens? It strengthens the church to do what? To preach. We don't stop preaching when things get hard. We preach more. We preach more. We preach clearer. We preach louder. We preach in more places, in different places. We preach the gospel wherever it needs to go, and we pray, Lord, send me, use me wherever. When I get ridiculed by my neighbor for constantly you church people believe in fairy tales. Well, let's talk about that. What are fairy tales? What is true? Let, we, don't, we, don't, we don't go, oh, that person doesn't like me. We say, Lord, give me a word to help be helpful here. Maybe, there's, maybe it's not you. Maybe you're the one who's antagonistic, but maybe 
your, your family's over and they're willing to listen. You know, like there has to be this sense of, no, some, the gospel changes lives. The good news of Jesus Christ is the power to bring salvation. And so we're not to clamp it down when things get hard. We're to ramp it up. We're to speak boldly without fear. Open our mouths. I mean, we see this so clearly. Just a few examples. Acts 8, uh, Philippians, or I'm sorry, Philip, he was one of the seven who was chosen by the group. And what happens? There was a persecution that took place. And when the persecution took place, they spread, the gospel spread out in different places. Here's one of the, the stories of that. Um, there was a eunuch, an Ethiopian eunuch, verse 34 of chapter 8. And the eunuch said to Philip, uh, about whom, I ask you, does this prophet say, because he was reading the scriptures of an Isaiah, about himself or about someone else? He's, and then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scriptures, told him the good news about Jesus. He said, yes, let me tell you specifically what the scriptures say about Jesus. And then even just go back to what happened in Paul in, in Acts in 16, ver- dealing with the Philippian church. Talking to the jailer there, he says, he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And so they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in the house. They weren't secretive about it. They said, everybody needs to hear this. Bring in all your peoples. Come on, let's speak it boldly. We're not scared of, of this. We need to speak this. And so I wanted to ask you, what is something that helps you, what helps you to confidently share the gospel with others? What is it that girds you, that helps you? A lot of times, in this case, it was the example of others. It was Paul not giving in while he was chained to a guard. What did that do? That example of another brother who was all in for Jesus just encouraged a whole church, right? So that, so that that church now was more bold, was preaching more clearly, was not being held back by fear. No, it was the example of Paul. Well, what other examples might you have? What are the, who are the people that encourage you because of their boldness? Brother Fernando, I want to say thank you for how you boldly share the gospel as of one of our church. You encourage me. You encourage us when you invite people and tell people about the gospel. Uh, you, you bring us up, brother. Thank you for that. We want to bring each other up. We want to share the gospel, and we want to encourage others to do the same. Oh, a lot of times, uh, sharing the gospel, it's a team sport, right? It's, it's something we should do together. It's something we should pray for one another, something we should encourage each other in. Maybe it's uh, individuals here that we know. Maybe it's stories from history. Maybe it's even in our own experience. I mean, we don't even have to go that far back. Let's just think during the time of COVID. During the time of COVID, when people, uh, when churches and everybody's getting shut down, there were certain churches that stayed open. There were certain churches. Remember the whole thing that happened in Canada with Pastor James Coates and how he preached? I mean, his story was, was very similar to, to John Bunyan, except for his was 35 days, but it was in a maximum security prison. And he was given the same thing. If you sign a paper that says you won't preach, then you can be released. Well, he didn't sign that paper because he knew that that very next Sunday he was going to keep his church open and they were going to preach. And so he didn't sign it. It was only until external pressures made them release uh, Pastor Coates. Or Pastor John MacArthur, when he stayed open, when he sued him and the whole church, sued the state saying, you can't close us down. There are examples of people who are being courageous, who are being fearless, and are saying, no, we, we cannot stop the gospel we must keep going. What is it that encourages you to be confident and to share the gospel? The example of others, historical in our own lives. Or maybe it's just praying, praying for one another, not just... In fact, look at Paul. Paul asked for prayer. Let's go to Ephesians 6. He's, he's telling them to pray at all times for everything, but then he specifically asked for a prayer request. He said, pray for me that I would, I would preach boldly. Uh, verse 18 of chapter 6. And praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Pray for one another, intercessory prayer, and also for me. Please pray for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly. Paul even had to ask for help. Please help me. Pray for me that I wouldn't wimp out, that I wouldn't give up. 
No, that I would open my mouth boldly to what? To proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. You see? In chains. That I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Every Christian, if you are a Christian, is called in one way or another to speak the words of Christ. They speak it to themselves as they preach the gospel to themselves, but then they also share it to others. If you're parents, you are to preach the gospel to your children. You are not to give them the option to believe something else. That's not loving. That's not true. You're not to say it's up to you to believe in folly if you want. You say, no, believe the gospel. Believe the truth. It, it is God's goodness to offer salvation to you. And when you're ready, be all in with Christ. Obey the words. God's given us family to speak to, right? Those are, talk about providentially ordered. God has providentially ordered everybody to have families. He's, he's given us specific people to already be connected to. So that means he's given us people to preach to, to people to share the gospel with, to, to love and serve. He's given us coworkers. He's given us neighbors. He's given us the ability and awareness to share with those who might be going on our path to have a, a state of mind that says, I could be interrupted. I could take a little bit longer if this particular need for a conversation takes up. I'll go ahead and trust the Lord that even if it's five minutes, but what do we need to be confident? It's, we need a doctrine that says God is working all things out for his glory and, that, and our good, even in the hard stuff. And we need to know that we're called to do this. This is not optional. This is what is necessary for the gospel to go out. Well, let's look at our last point for this morning. What are we to learn from this imprisonment report? And we see that God is orchestrating all things, even through suffering and difficulty, and that in that orchestration, we are called to be faithful witnesses of the gospel. Well, let's see here, the third point. It's that believers are called to rejoice whenever that, that gospel is proclaimed by anyone. We are to rejoice when Christ is preached, even when others preach Christ with mixed motives, with false motives. That's what we see clearly here, in, starting in verse 15. He's saying, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. He's saying, hey, a bunch of people are preaching the gospel now because I'm in prison, and, and they're more bold to preach the gospel. This is good news. But then he makes distinctions within them. He goes, some of them are preaching for good reasons. It's like, yeah, they, they love me. They love the gospel. They love the Lord. But he also calls out, there are some Christians, and he is talking about Christians here. He's not talking about false, um, false people. He's talking about the church, which shows you that the church is a mixed group of people who are still sinners working out all their stuff. They need to work it out with the Lord. But what does he call out? He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, not good things, those are sins, but others from goodwill. The latter, out of, do it out of love, knowing that I was put here for the defense of the gospel. Those people have the right understanding. Like, no, God is doing something good and right, even though it's hard for Paul. And so we're going to we're going to follow in that. But look what 17 says. The former, those who do it out of envy and rivalry, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What does he do with this? There are people who are actually trying to one-up Paul while he's chained and in prison to a guard and in his house imprisonment. Verse 18 shows you his amazing perspective something that we should learn from. It says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. This is an incredible passage. What are we seeing? Paul is not complaining about his prison imprisonment, house imprisonment. He's not complaining about not being free. He's saying God is orchestrating all of it so that the gospel can go out. And what is he saying? And what is happening to me is blessing all of you, church, church members, because I know that many of you are preaching the gospel because you see what I'm doing, what I'm going through. And then he says, and even some of you aren't doing it for right reasons. There are some people out there in the Christian world who are preaching Christ, but they're doing it because they're trying to get at me. 
they are trying to one-up me or do it for their own platform, but they're still preaching the truth. And so I say, hey, if they're preaching Christ, even out of false motives, I'm just glad that they're preaching Christ. Now, let's talk about what that means and what that doesn't mean. Let me read a quote here I think is helpful uh, from Dennis Johnson talking about this very thing. He says, some of the gospel preachers whose eagerness had been aroused by Paul's chains might have, might, uh, chains have mixed motives at best. Many spread the word about Christ because they love Paul, that's true. They recognize God's approval of his ministry, and they know that he has been put here, confined by chains through God's sovereign appointment for the defense of the gospel. They get it. They're like, oh, this is what's supposed to happen. But some, but some are preaching Christ to exalt themselves and humiliate Paul. They see themselves as Paul's rival for eminence in the Christian community, in the imperial capital. Since Paul seems to be sidelined by his legal troubles in their envy and rivalry, they swoop into the vacuum and strike, uh, strive to rack up a convert count that will put Paul's to shame. You know what this is? This is Christian ministry rivalry. This is Christians who care more about their own ministries being seen as successful, that's really what's going on. They want a big following. They want a big church. They want to be seen as prominent. They want to be seen as, um, you know, successful. And so they go, in fact, there is this belief, and it's around, it's alive well and today, that the only time you're in God's will is if you're prospering, right? If you're doing well. In fact, see, Paul, look at Paul's in prison, Paul, why are you have to cause all this trouble? You're making us look bad. See, well, here's what we're going to do. While he's in prison, we're going to preach, and we're going to show you, Paul, that uh, we're going to do it right. We're going to preach and show you that you don't have to go to prison. We're going we're to be able to do it without going to prison. Ready? Here's Christ. Here's Christ. Here's Christ. Now, what is he saying? Is he saying that it's good that they have rivalry and envy and conceit. No, he's not condoning their motives. He's calling out their motives. He's saying they doing it for wrong reasons. They care more about their own platform. They care more about their own followers. But here's the, that's that's sin. But he's saying, but even out of wrong motives, even then God's sovereign, and people could get saved by somebody actually preaching the gospel to them, and they hear and believe the gospel and respond. And he goes hey, I trust God's sovereignty. Now, they need to stop doing it for the wrong reasons, but they're preaching the gospel. So I'm going to rejoice in that much. I'm not going to rejoice in their sin. I'm going to rejoice in their words of Christ. And we know that he's not okay with false teaching. So this was a true gospel presentation. Um, we know he's not okay with, with, with any of this. In fact, I mean, we just read it in our, in our member meeting this morning. I'll read it again. Look at what Paul says to the Galatians about false gospels. Verse 6 of chapter 1, he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who calling you in, in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but that there are some who trouble you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached, let him be accursed. Literally, let him go to hell. Let him be damned forever. These are some of the strongest words in Scripture we have for false preachers. We know that Paul is not okay with false teaching and preaching. He's not, so, so we then must understand that these preachers are preaching rightly the Word of God, but he knows internally somehow that he knows they're doing it for other reasons too. It's mixed. They're not doing it because they love the Lord necessarily or love the people they're preaching to. They're preaching the gospel with mixed motives. And look at just later on in the same Philippian letter, he says, chapter 3, verse 2, look out for the dogs. This is what he calls the dogs, which are those circumcision group. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Right? These are the circumcised, circumcisers. He clearly is not okay with false teaching and false teachers. But in this weird circumstance, he is able to see the big picture and say, hey, they're doing it for the wrong reason, but God can and even does save people out of that. I mean, maybe that's even some of your experiences, that there have been people who have been a part of other churches, 
false churches, different mixed churches, different teaching, different... Um, but uh, Lord used that to save them, right? The Lord has used that to save them. And then over time, the Lord has also used that to bring them out of those churches and out of those ministries so that they find other ministries and other churches. I mean, that's not uncommon at all that people would find, uh, that the people who get saved out of poor ministries would actually move into other ministries that are more doctrinally sound, that are, that are doing things for the right reasons. Praise the Lord that uh, God is gracious and kind with us, right? That he, that he uses even our, our mixed motives sometimes. I could say that for me. I, I could say with, with humility, not something I'm proud of, that not everything I have said has been true in the past, that I've had to grow in my doctrine, I've had to grow. But by God's grace, I think I've been doing it for the right reasons. Although I can look back and say, you know what? I did think at a previous time that I cared too much about the size of our church or about the size, about certain parts of our ministry that weren't the, the, the main thing. I, I could admit that as a, as a pastor, as a young minister, that there's, there's temptations. In fact, um, it's, not, it's not uncommon. I mean, I'm, I've been a pastor for more than 15 years now, and I've been around enough to see that preachers care about numbers. They care about Platforms, they care about influence, just like anybody else. They're people too. And so do we. We care about being seen as legitimate. And so we often compare ourselves to what's going on around. And I think this is a good call of careful correction if any of us are struggling with this. We need to rejoice wherever the gospel is being preached. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful about doctrine. We absolutely should. We should be careful about practice. But if people are getting saved, if God is using those, those means through the preaching of the gospel, then we should say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. Let me ask you, how, how quick are you to celebrate the gospel spreading? Is your, are, you, are, are you quick to say, praise the Lord, if you hear about another Christian at another church, at another ministry who's learning and growing? Are you quick to do that? Praise the Lord. Instead of, oh, but yeah, they're a part of something different. They're a part of something not like us. It's true. Truth matters. But it's also true. God uses a bunch of sinners who are messed up, and it's only by his grace. What's on the wall? It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's a bedrock of what we believe. It, and so we're always seeking to reform and get more aligned with the scriptures, more aligned with the scriptures. God is constantly purging our hearts of things that aren't right. And so we should stay humble and we should celebrate when God is doing anything um, while also keeping our, our eyes of discernment on. Let me uh, read a scripture from 1 Corinthians 12. It talks about if we really are in Christ, we are one body and we need all members of the body. We need all the other churches. In fact, that's why we regularly pray for other churches. As, as a congregation, we pray not just for our own body, we pray for other churches. Why? Because we acknowledge we're not the only church. There are many churches out there. There are many churches that preach the gospel. We want to pray for them. We want God to work through their ministries too, not just our own. It's important. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This is the kind of heart that we're supposed to have. We should be so grateful if God is doing good ministry in other churches. I think we are. I'm really grateful for this church. He is growing us in our love for the Lord, love for the gospel, love for the church. We want to celebrate whenever God is doing good things. We want to, obviously, we want him to do good things in our own midst, and so we want to submit to his will. But we also want to celebrate whatever God is doing that's true, not the false doctrine, not the prosperity gospel. We're not celebrating false religions. We're not celebrating when, when Jehovah's Witnesses or other um, false teaching goes out. That's not something we celebrate. We, we celebrate when the gospel goes out, the true gospel. And so we rejoice with all the church even if it's not our specific one. You know, we're called to a high calling here, and we're to learn a lot from this passage. We are to, to have this perspective in us that says, no matter what the situation, when my car goes out, when my health goes out, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm moved to a state of discomfort, I should see God's will taking place. What does he want me to do? 
What does he want me to do? Trust him and seek for opportunities to preach the gospel, right? That's what he's calling us to do and to celebrate wherever that gospel goes out. But we must acknowledge this is not something we can do on our own strength. This right perspective, this right heart, this, this, this desire to preach the gospel, that's not something that we just muster up. It's something that we must run to Christ for. He is the one who perfectly obeyed, not us. We must go to the gospel and say, I can't just make this happen. I can't just love the Lord you know, with all my heart by myself. It's actually something that God needs to give me. He needs to spiritually change my heart. And so I need to ask for it in prayer. I need to humble myself. And what does God say in the word? He says he gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. In fact, he does not want us doing this in our own strength. If we do it in our own strengths, it's works of the flesh. In fact, we might fall into the same trap of these other ministries that are doing things to try to one-up one another. No, no, no. We must do all these, have the right perspective, seek to be gospel preaching and gospel teaching, and to even celebrate others' wins, not from our own strength. We must do it from Christ himself. And so let me read in Hebrews what it says. We look to Christ and to his work. So let us run with endurance the race is, that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured all the difficulties, same ones that we will endure if he was so pleased, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. We don't look to ourselves and our own strength. We look to Christ and his strength, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Is it, is it hard to do in your own strength? Yes, it is hard to do in your own strength. So then run to Jesus and say, Lord, help me have the right attitude. Remind me of the right perspective. Encourage me not to, to grumble or to be overly concerned with my own comfort. Remind me of how, in the same way I need the gospel, others need the gospel, and they've never heard it, or they need to be reminded of it. And then remind me, Lord, that I'm not seeking to compare myself to others. I'm seeking to celebrate whatever your good work is happening everywhere else. We can only do it with the power of Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Christ, we thank you for your work of righteousness on this earth and work of substitution, Lord, on the cross. We're so grateful that you are the gospel, your person and your work. You are the good news. And Lord, may we seek to always understand that you are seeking to spread your good news everyone to everyone everywhere. And Lord, you've called us to partner in that, to to personally preach that to ourselves, our family, our neighbors, to to preach that as a church every Sunday and and through the the working of our ministries, through the working of missionaries. And Lord, you've called us to celebrate wherever it happens whether it's part of our church or not. Lord, so help us, help us by your power. Give us the mind of Christ. Give us the heart that the Spirit gives true joy that's not based on our circumstances, but based on the gospel. Lord, give us a joy that is enduring and lasting forever. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen.